So, hello everyone. Hello everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, I know there are lots of you there. Actually, we had more than 1,000 uh, registrations. And that's why we had to move to this system, to the Zoom system. Um, this means that the reasons for which we, we started this webinar were uh, well sounded and uh, we r needed to respond to an actual uh, need, uh, the need of getting directions on how to move online on such a, a difficult situation uh, we are uh, experiencing. Um, I wanted to, to, to share uh, my, uh, my screen uh, to uh, 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 show you uh, a very brief uh, introduction and leave uh, the floor to Tony. You are all here to uh, to listen uh, to listen to. So uh, I will share my screen. Just a moment. So. Hmm, uh, this is a joint initiative. Uh, the supporting group is made by me, Antonella Poce, that's my name. I chair the uh, Network of Academics and Professionals Steering Committee from Eden. Uh, in the supporting group, we have been all together working to uh, um, uh, allow this uh, uh, opportunity for everyone. There's Lisa Marie Blansk, uh, who is uh, uh, representing the fellow council of Eden, and she is from the University of Oldenburg, and Timothy Reed uh, from the Eden EC Executive Committee, Vice President and Pro Vice Chancellor at UNAD. Uh, we, uh, as I said, we are trying to to meet uh, an actual demand from a large uh, audience. Uh, there's a true educational uh, emergency and we will try to learn uh, how to be online together, as our hashtag uh, says. Um, we will be rolling out uh, a series of practical webinars focusing on day-by-day -day challenges our, our teachers and educators uh, face uh, today. And we will also um, try to, to meet certain broader institutional uh, as aspects. Um, the series of webinars we're going to have weekly uh, will have the opportunity to um, to allow experts and experienced pr practitioners uh, uh, talk. Um, we will be uh, working, um, we'll try at least to work uh, uh, the same way every time, having a, a presentation from our expert and then a question and answer uh, session. So from now, I ask you to participate, to be active, to write your your questions in the chat that you find uh, below. Um, and uh, uh, I will pick up uh, some of the questions. Of course, there are so many of you, so we are not able to pick up all the questions, but we'll try to get, um, you know, some, some questions and discuss them with, uh, with our uh, presenter. Um, so please be aware of having activated your chat uh, box uh, below. Uh, I'm not stealing more time to our presenter. He, you know, you all know uh, uh, him. You're all eager to listen to him talking. Uh, I will be uh, very, very uh, brief in introducing him. You know him. He is author of several books in the field of online and distance learning. 
Um, he has provided consulting services specializing in training and planning and management of online learning and distance education, working with over 40 organizations in 25 different countries. Tony is based at Contact North, but he will tell you more about him. And I really thank him for being with us. We are really honored uh, to have him with us to start to open uh, this series. Um, don't hesitate in, in using our hashtag and uh, thank you. I'm uh, really uh, moved that so many people are there and that our community is so large and active today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much from the deep of the crisis here in Italy. Thank you. So the floor is yours. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, Tony, I'll stop. Uh, okay. Okay, I took, um, it's okay for uh, uh, Tony. Tony, yeah, okay. Hello, yeah. Oh, okay. Hello everyone, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to speak to so many people. Um, I, I wish the circumstances for um, this meeting were, were better than they are. Um, we're all facing a huge challenge here. Um, and I'm a little unhappy about doing this, to be honest, not just because of the circumstances, but uh, this is a new situation for everyone. Um, and I'm not sure I have the knowledge or experience to be able to help those of you who've been thrust or pushed into a situation where suddenly you have to go online and you've never done it before. And um, I was talking to my son yesterday, who is a professor at microbiology in Nottingham University. And he said, I've got to go online. I've never done it before. And I said, oh, how are you feeling about it? He said, oh, it's not a problem. It's just common sense, isn't it? And I said, well, thanks, son. That's 50 years learning and experience just gone down the tube. Um, I did point out to him that common sense is the result of often a thousand years experience. But nevertheless, that there, there are things that we can learn um, from the past, but there are also things today that you really have to discover for yourselves. So the, the, the other reason I'm a little unhappy about doing this is that how you handle this move to online learning depends so much on your context. If you're in an institution that has been teaching online for the last 10 to 15 years, it's, it's much less of a challenge than if your institution has never taught online before. So um, with that background, um, I'm going to switch to a, a PowerPoint. Um, so... I've called it from panic to peace of mind, transitioning to online learning. Um, what do you do in an emergency? What do you do triage? Um, you see, you, you can't operate as you would do in a standard um, hospital setting where everything's planned before you go into an operation and so on. Uh, you deal with a situation as it is, and solutions aren't always the best ones, um, the best possible ones, but they are the best ones in the circumstance. So I'm not going to criticize anybody for what they do in this situation if it's the first time you've been in this situation. <clears throat> I want to concentrate on three things. Immediate actions for moving online. The medium term. What should we be doing over the next few months to prepare for the fall, the, um, the autumn? <clears throat> and then the long term, what should we be doing? Because this is not going to be the only time that your institution will have to face an emergency where everybody has to go online. This could be for any number of reasons, a public health scare, uh, an, a national uh, climate disaster, um, terrorism on the campus. Uh, it could be any number of reasons why uh, the university or the campus must closed and we need to be better prepared than we have been uh, up to now for that situation so <clears throat> what would i advise anybody um, who's having to do it for the first time talk to the professionals 
Um, if you have them in your institution, if you have a department um, or an organization within your institution that's been teaching online, go and talk to them before you do anything. Because online is different. It's not rocket science, as my son pointed out, um, but it is different. And you, know, you need to know the differences. It's particularly different for the students. And I'll talk about that in a, a bit more detail. Now, many of, I know that many of your institutions don't have any professionals. You don't have a department for online learning that deals with online learning. You may not have even a teaching and learning center in your institution. So my advice to you, if you don't have anybody to talk to to get advice, think before you start. Go online. Research this online. There are lots of good places. Now, I, I put up a slide here. This is from the University of Illinois. One of the things you, if you've never gone online, you'll learn is that there's a lot of open, free resources, open education resources that you can go to online. This from the University of Illinois is online course in a box. It actually tells you how to design an online course. Um, there's lots of stuff out there that you can go to. Uh, spend a day researching best practices. Um, avoid the commercial providers. They're trying to sell you something. But there are a lot of public institutions that are open about what they do. So do some research. The first thing when you think about what you're going to do is, do I need to change my course? Can I just put my lectures up online? Now, we know from the past that there's lots of problems with just putting particularly one hour or even longer lectures online. First of all, they're too long. They're boring. Also, there's a bandwidth issue here. If you, unless you compress your PowerPoint slides, um, you can easily overload not only your own institution servers, but the, the bandwidth that students are using. Remember that everybody's at home these days is using the internet for all kinds of reasons. Um, if you have kids playing video games, then it's going to be hard to get online to research because it's going to, uh, to, to watch a long lecture because the bandwidth, the Wi-Fi bandwidth you've got just won't hand, handle it. Um, but also, it's boring. Um, there's a lot of research on the right length of a video lecture, and it's around about 10 minutes. Secondly, there's no interaction if you put your lectures online. If you just put them online without doing something else, and I'll come to that in a minute, you, you, it's hard for students to ask questions if you haven't prepared for that. And you don't want to get swamped with hundreds of questions either. So um, the other thing is, it's basically taking, a, taking a, um, a music hall act and trying to make, just record a video of it rather than making a movie. It's, you know, you're not making, taking advantages of the affordances of what online can do very well. And I'll explain what that is a little bit later. And the third thing about, uh, the fourth thing about putting your lectures online is it, it, it ignores how students will learn online. We know from research now that most students work in chunks of less than one hour when they're studying online. And when you think about it, again, it's common sense, as my son would say. They're at home, they've got kids running in and out, um, or they're on a bus trying, trying to uh, uh, catch up on, on, on their mobile phones and so on. So you need to break up online learning into manageable chunks for the students. And you'll see what happens if you're not careful you can easily overload the students, as the, as the image indicates. So, but the problem is, you need at least a month if you're going to change the way you're going to teach. So I don't criticize anybody who wants to immediately put their lectures online, because that's all you can do. But if you've got a month to change, and some of you will have because your institutions have closed, um, then Spend a bit of time preparing for, for going online. So if you're going to move, take your same course and move it online, make sure you choose the appropriate technologies. And again, ask the professionals. We had to switch for this webinar from Adobe Connect to Zoom because suddenly we found we had more participants than we could manage. You need a professional who understands the difference between 
different uh, um, video conferencing systems and so on to see what will best work in your situation, in your institution. Now, you may have a preference. You may like Zoom over Adobe Connect, but use the technology that your professionals advise because they can support that technology. There's not much difference between them in the long run. The difference is at the back end rather than at the front end. Um, secondly, if you're going to go on, put your le lectures online, make sure you do it within a virtual learning environment or a learning management system like Canvas or Moodle or Blackboard. You're, if your campus is actually already using one. Um, if you're not using one, you've got big problems. And I'll give you some advice on that a little bit later. And the third thing is that once you get into that vir virtual learning environment, make sure you have clear instructions for the students as to what they must do each week. Within the learning management system, provide a weekly structure. Um, by that I mean this is what you do from Sunday through to Saturday this week uh, as, as a student. This is what you should be doing. Uh, this is what you have to do at the end of the week. And here's what you do to prepare for the next week. Uh, you can put your recorded lectures up there. I've mentioned the technology behind that. Um, required reading. Um, if they have readings to do, again, online, there is an enormous amount of free online academic reading, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, um, such as open education resources. In my province, uh, every first and second year course at university and college, there is an open textbook that students can download for free that's been validated by the professors in the province. Uh, you may not find that in your jurisdiction. Again, most of this material is in English, I'm afraid, but, um, but you can put a lot of the readings or students can access the readings online if they're directed to it. Other student activities, particularly the discussion forums, learning management systems have discussion forums, which are very, very useful for giving students activities, it was more important in some subject areas than others. And then assignments are also built into the, into the learning management system. And again, don't argue about the learning management system. You might prefer Moodle to Blackboard or vice versa. Use what your institution has got because it's supported and they can teach you and help you if you have problems with it. Um, watch the student workload. Um, it's one of the things that tends to happen when people move online is they overload the students with work because you, you can see how much work you can suddenly put into a virtual learning environment. Uh, I recommend about 30 to 40 hours a week for all courses that a student is taking simultaneously at any one time. So if they're taking four or five courses, that means eight to 10 hours a week for one course. And that activity, uh, that should include all their activities, including assignments, tests, and exams. And again, you can see if you're going to have three three-hour lectures and then work flowing out of that, that can be um, really a large amount of work and very difficult for students to absorb those big chunks of learning. So reduce or shorten the lectures if you can. Assessment. If you have objective testing, that is uh, memorized tests of memorization or comprehension, you can use computer marked assignments. The learning management system allows you to create your own computer marked assignments. Uh, but you can also use formative assessment, uh, grades for online work and activities. Now, some instructors like to give grades for students' participation in online discussion forums. I don't like to do that. I like to link the topic of the discussions to assignments and let the students know that there's going to be assignment on this. And if they get in and discuss maybe a similar question to the assignment question, not the same question, then that's going to help them do their assignments. Um, but you can assess students as they work through because one of the big differences between face to face and online is that you have a recording of what students do in online. So you can actually see better how they're working than you can in a face-to-face -face group where they just go outside the lecture. They may be talking amongst each other, but you can't track that, whereas you can in online learning. 
is large classes, break them into groups, get them to do group projects, um, and use e-portfolios like Mahara, which allows students to record their work and organize it like a portfolio of work online. And that uh, they can share that with you so you can see how students are progressing. That's the short term. In the medium term, for the fall semester, now who knows whether we'll be back again in the fall, but um, maybe in October, maybe a little bit later than that, but at some point the students are gonna come back into the university, then what are you gonna do? Well, what I suggest now, your institution should be immediately hiring more online course designers and web and support people now. They should be doing that now to get them in position to support faculty, uh, especially if you're not back again, if, if campuses aren't back again in the fall. Um, there's several online courses out there on how to teach online. Get your institution to get one of these courses in uh, so faculty can actually spend some hours um, learning how to teach online through a course which will give them feedback and so on. Create standard online course design templates. There are a number of different uh, design models for online learning. Uh, they vary a bit from collaborative learning, experiential learning and so on, but make sure your institution has some off-the-shelf design templates in the learning management system that faculty can go in and try. And make sure your institution has upgraded the technology, um, such as making sure that the institution has enough bandwidth to handle a lot more online studies, that they have uh, servers or are move, moving stuff to the cloud, making sure that their learning management system can handle uh, the bigger numbers or get a learning management system in if you don't have one, and make sure you've got good video recording and streaming technology. So there are a number of things to do between now and say September. The institution should also be developing student policies about expectations, what they're supposed to do when they're not on campus, uh, accessibility issues, how do students who um, are blind or deaf, how do they manage online? Can you, what kind of alternatives should faculty provide for them? And access, what happens if students don't have high-speed internet, for instance? Uh, what's the policy there? Um, and an online assessment strategy. If your students can't come to campus to take exams, how are you going to organize that? Again, there's lots of ways of handling this, but uh, you can actually have online proctoring systems. You, you, you pay for those, but students can actually be monitored studying, uh, uh, taking an exam from home. For instance, some proctoring systems will, will uh, indicate when the student goes out of the uh, app for the, for, for the um, exam and starts looking up stuff. If that's not allowed, it will automatically flag that and that will be flagged against the student's performance, for instance. So there is stuff out there for online assessment. It's just a question of doing the research and finding it. For instructors, um, collect feedback on your course. Find out what worked and what didn't when you went online this, this, this month. And then take that feedback and rethink, adapt, and redi redesign your course for the fall. So that means tracking a little bit what students are doing. Um, how many students completed, et cetera? How many students dropped out? Where did they drop out? Um, try, to, try to get that information on your own course to feed into. Uh, did you get swamped with emails? Were they all about the same topic? That means you probably didn't teach that topic very well. Can you improve that topic next time round? Um, for the fall semester, for the medium term, start looking at a new way of designing that actually fits the online environment. Remember now that nearly all content Everything that you teach is already online and free, at least in English. It may not be in your national language. Um, there's a massive amount of content out there now. Everything, even the latest research papers, are often in open, ac 
open publications so your students can go and get to the latest research. That means you don't have to deliver content. Students can go and find, evaluate, analyze, and organize that information. It's already out there. And this is one of the huge shifts in pedagogy that online learning allows. You can, of course, do that in class, but it's much easier for students to do it online. And move towards topic or problem-based learning, where you focus on skills development. We're hearing from employers all the time that they need students with skills like critical thinking, problem solving, uh, communication skills. And by building problem-based work online, getting students to work in groups, learning collaborative learning, for instance, which they need when they get into the workforce, then again, online learning is a huge opportunity to teach better. Now, what do you do in the long term? when you reach a stable state. Your institution should have a digital learning strategy. What proportion of your courses should be either fully online or a mix of online and face-to-face -face in five years' time? And how do we get there? What should be the right mix for your institution? Should you have all courses blended or should you just have or, or should it just be certain parts of the university, it's all blended, but other parts, like maybe in science, where you have to have students come to campus, uh, but not necessarily for the whole of the course or the program. They can do some online and some on campus. What is your strategy for that? How is that going to vary between the different academic departments? You should have um, an overall view uh, of where you're going as an institution. Um, make sure you've got strong centers for learning technologies or digital learning. I put up one here from the University of Bristol. It's now called the Digital Education Office. Um, make sure you have the people with the skills and knowledge to support faculty in this area. Um, plan for instructor training and development. Uh, make sure that the faculty know how to teach online or if they are blend doing blended learning, what's best done face-to-face -face and what's best done online. And have an emergency plan in place for remote learning so that if tomorrow suddenly you have to move to remote learning, everybody in the institution knows what to do and is prepared for it. Um, I don't th think there's any excuse in the future for institutions not having an emergency plan for remote learning. So in conclusion, we can't go back to where we were. One thing that this crisis has, is really going to do is to shift the way we think about teaching and learning. We will have exposed not people not just to COVID-19, but we will have exposed a lot of faculty and instructors to online learning for the first time. We have to recognize that online learning is now an integral part of higher education. Um, it, going to be a mix of blended learning and fully online. In my view, all institutions will have some blended, will have most of their courses either blended or fully online in the future. And that means our teaching methods need to change. Well, they need to change for a number of reasons, not just because of the technology, but because we need to move away from content delivery to skills development. Um, because the content is all out there and it's fast, growing faster than anybody can handle. We can't teach all the content in any subject area now. Uh, what we have to teach is knowledge management, how students can handle that expansion of knowledge. We also need to rethink the campus. I, I've got an image up here of the uh, interactive classrooms at the University of uh, Queen's University in uh, Ontario. Uh, you'll see that the instructors in, is, is at a pod. It's a little bit like Star Trek, um, Captain Kirk in the pod. Uh, the students work in, in groups around a table. Each table has a screen. Uh, students can plug their computers in. And they also have individual corrals where students can go off and do individual work and come back and bring it back to the group and so on. So we need to rethink the campus. Uh, if we go into blended learning and maybe reducing face-to-face -face teaching by as much as 20 to 30 percent, 
what kind of canvas do we need? So, and lastly, something like this, something like COVID-19 will happen again. And we need to be much better prepared than we've been for this, this time round. So thank you very much. And I'm going to come out and back. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, there are lots of questions coming, coming from uh, the um, chat, but coming from YouTube too. Uh, because as you know, uh, we are going, uh, uh, we have a streaming going on on YouTube, uh, trying to allow most uh, of you uh, participate in our uh, webinar uh, today. Uh, so I'll start with the questions because there are so many and I want uh, uh, to give uh, uh, feedback to most of them. So, um, uh, the discussion is very lively. Um, what can we do, uh, they are asking Tony, um, to activate uh, communication uh, among the students, especially when we have large classes uh, um, at the moment, uh, I know we were we, we, as you explained uh, very clearly, we need time to plan for this kind of teaching and learning, but at the moment, most of us has been forced uh, to go online from one minute to the other. Uh, so it's very important to activate communication uh, among students, but what would you suggest? Which is the best way? Well, immediately, um, yeah. Immediately, again, I, it depends on the context. Uh, if you have a learning management system, then uh, break the uh, break the class into groups. If you, again, it depends on the subject matter that you're teaching. Um, if you're teaching sciences, it, it's more difficult. But if you're teaching humanities or social sciences. If you've got a class of 120, then break them into, say, 10 groups of 12. Now, you can manage 10 groups. You, you don't have to manage it, actually. You, you post questions for the students to discuss, and then you just go in and monitor it, uh, monitor each one. Um, and you don't have to read everything uh, in each one. But where you see students either not behaving properly, like being rude to other students, or completely misunderstanding something, then just step in with a comment. The most important thing for online students is called instructor presence. Instructor presence online. They'd like to know that you're there and paying attention to what they're doing. Um, and so if you put students in groups, try to make sure that at least once a week, every group gets some comments from you. Um, um, Make sure you have good discussion questions. As I said, I like to link them to assignments. Um, so um, put, put maybe the topics for assignments up at the beginning of the course. Again, backward design. Think about how you're going to assess the students. And then what do the students have to do to ma match that assessment? Um, and so if you know what kind of assignment questions you're going to ask at the beginning of the course, you can then set topics that will help students when they come to those assignment questions. But the other thing is you have to be very explicit and transparent to the students about what you're doing when you're online. Yeah, yeah um, of course. Okay. So, so so, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, another question which I think most of the audience um, would, would ask you is related to um, what is possible when you have low tech and low bandwidth, uh, especially in areas where you know the, the bandwidth is, is low. What can we do? Is there something that, that we, we can use that we can cope with? Uh, you can use email. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you can actually do quite a lot with just email alone. Um, uh, you, you can add attachments to your email, for instance, so, although, again, be careful about the size of the attachments. Um, in other words, break your lectures up into smaller segments 
if you're going to send them as attachments to email. Um, and uh, again, more difficult if you haven't got a learning management system. Um, but I, I wouldn't recommend email for a class of over 50 or 60. But if you've got a class of under 50 or 60, then you can have, um, again, you can break them into groups and have them discuss as well through email. Uh, they can set up their own email um, links and so on. Um, it's not difficult. Uh, if you go to my, I, I'll give you my website. I have a link to some a colleague of mine, Tennis Morgan, who's got a very nice article on how to teach using email and other. And that's very that's very interesting and very very useful. Um, another question is related to motivation. How can we support motivation? You suggested at the beginning that it's. Uh, uh, advisable to uh, divide the students in in groups and make them work in in groups but uh, uh, we know that group work sometimes can be annoying for for some uh, in the group being lazy or other being more active and too active uh, <laughs> compared to other ones so wh what would you suggest to support uh, motivation and participation and sharing of the I'm going to make a general comment here. Many of the problems that we think of as being online learning problems are not specific to online learning. They're specific to face-to-face -to -face teaching as well. So motivation is a problem both face-to-face -face and online. Yeah. Um, having said that, um, what you often find with online students is that uh, their initial reaction is that this is going to be less work. Um, and uh, I, oh, I can just do it when I feel like it. And that's why you have to build in structure into your courses with regular uh, weekly activities that students must do. Um, and now, this is what I call extrinsic motivation. Um, but again, this is why having very clear learning activities for students and some form of feedback to them so they know that their activities are being monitored to some extent. You don't have to give a grade for everything, but um, some encouraging comments. Again, if you have a group of 12 students and you encourage one, the others will see that. So, um, and, and often, especially young students, first year students, they are, they, they are not so well organized as, late, as students in later years. Uh, they are more what I call dependent learners. And they need a lot more help online than students in third and fourth years. So, um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Uh, I don't know if. Uh, I was, sharing that. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. That's good. That's good. There are, there's lots of uh, uh, chatting there, and everyone is uh, trying also to share different resources. So that's, that means that we are really building a, a large community where everyone wants to, to uh, contribute and participate. Uh, but more, more questions. This is a, a very important question. Um, what about students with disabilities? Do you have suggestions for, for, for that? Yes, well, you, um, there are various things you can do. Uh, in PowerPoint, for instance, you can actually record a PowerPoint so students who have visual impairment can listen to, uh, to what you're doing. You, if you, um, I can't remember exactly now. I'd have to go into PowerPoint to find out how you do it. I think you go into um, slideshow and then uh, scroll down and you'll see something about uh, recording voice over to, to, the, to the PowerPoint slides. A uh, general rule of thumb is in online learning, provide at least two um, media of communication, audio and video, if you can, and text. So you've got three media, really, text, audio, and video. And duplication, um, as much duplication as possible. So uh, there are a set of uh, guidelines called uh, um, uh, for online learning. Again, I'd have to look up the reference for this. I hope somebody who's uh, participating can put something into the um, chat 
where you can go and get guidelines on designing online learning to deal with accessible to deal with disabilities and so on. So yes, yes, that's very very important because we need to uh, to take care of this aspect uh, that sometimes is uh, uh, neglected, and instead, especially for accessibility disability, um, online learning can be a great. Uh, support and help. So that is a field that we really need to exploit and support through uh, technology. Uh, then there's this uh, great issue, and I'm very much concerned about this uh, this area. That is the area of assessment. Um, uh, as far as assessment is concerned. Um, which tool uh, can you mention that can be useful uh, to carry out assessment? And uh, what about uh, the uh, risk, uh, the possibility of cheating? Um, this is a huge, huge area. I mean, it's, uh, it's really something that teachers uh, uh, are very much concerned about. Uh, because uh, assessment uh, uh, would be, uh, especially uh, in this situation, you know, we are stuck in, in my country in particular, we are stuck at home, we can't move, we can't go out, there's police checking you, so we can't really reach uh, any uh, other place uh, away from home. Um, what can we do if we need to take an assessment session uh, trying to assure, uh, you know, uh, the minimum uh, requirements for, uh, you know, have a proper assessment session? Okay, the, this is a huge question. Uh, depends on the subject area. Uh, very different mm -hmm. in science than in humanities, for instance. Uh, let me start again by saying this is not a problem unique to online. We have hmm. the same problem with face-to-face -face exams uh, like yeah. and so on. So, um, secondly, uh, remember that when students work online, you can track what they do. So, for that reason, I, I've moved more and more to continuous formative assessment rather than one exam at the end of a course. A mm -hmm. uh, number of advantages of that. Um, you can see how a student has progressed from the time they come in to the end of the course, for instance. Um, you can look at things like, uh, now again, it depends what your learning objectives are, but come back to the idea of skills development. If we're really concerned about improving students' communication skills, as well as the content of the subject, then you can assess their communication skills online, how, how they communicate in discussion forums and so on, and you can track that. So what I normally have is a spreadsheet for students, um, uh, a list of all the students, and then a list of all the activities across the top, and then I can continuously assess the students throughout the course on their grades and give them a grade at the end based on that rather than an end of course exam. And that to me is much more authentic um, than doing an online exam. The other thing is that, again, it depends. Some textbooks have, um, uh, some textbooks on, have an online website where they have assessment questions. Um, you could use those. Um, again, the problem is you don't know if the student's doing it or their parents, probably not their parents in my case. But, um, you know, so it's the same problems you would have often in a face-to-face -face class, though. Um, at some point, you know, that's why I like the formative assessment. And that's why I like project work, because there's no point cheating in a project. You, it's your project. You're doing it as a student. Uh, you might get help from other students, but that's what you want. You want students helping each other, but you can track what each student is contributing to the project online because you've got a record. So again, um, the quantitative stuff, the uh, objective testing is much easier because you've got all that 
you can, um, often the learning management system will have a bank of questions. You put up a bank of questions, you randomize them, um, and the students will take the test. It's automated. Um, so the objective testing is easy. It's when you try to assess students by essays and you suddenly have 100 essays coming in at the end of a, a, a course and you don't know whether the students have copied or not, all kinds of tools like Turnitin that will check, but it's not so much the tools. There are tools out there. It's your assessment strategy that matters. If you have a proper strategy that will discourage cheating, uh, cheating, then that's a much better approach than trying to get a technology that will automatically tell whether they've copied something. Again, um, quotations, for instance, it's all right. If, in my case, I say to students, fine, I don't mind you quoting somebody else so long as you put it in quotes. That's all you have to do. You don't have to cheat. Just say where you got it from. That's all you have to do. Cheating is laziness, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think there's all kind. Of, it's to do with you as a teacher and how you want to assess students more than what tools do I use online. So it's a change of perspective that we need. Uh, a change of uh, uh, cultural attitude. I, I think, uh, and this is. Uh, uh, a change which is uh, needed, um, first of all, in our own way of, of teaching, uh, individual way of teaching, of course, but this is, uh, um, relates also to the organization, to the governance, the management uh, area, uh, because uh, uh, this um, assessment, especially uh, in countries like Italy, uh, is connected to uh, the value of the certificate you gain at the end of, of uh, your program. Uh, so uh, what I, I think and from what you say is clear, we need to, uh, to ask for a change also from this point of view. Uh, we need to, as you said, to develop certain skills and to assess certain skills. We need a different way of assessing uh, what are our objectives and if the objectives change also assessment might must change uh, thank you for that because it was very clear and and important i think very relevant um other questions coming um how can we uh, find a, a, the right balance between uh, synchronous and asynchronous teaching and learning. This is a, a very nice question. What a question. great question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, again, the way I would approach this um, is to look at your learning objectives and the student activities required for them to achieve the learning objectives. And again, it depends on your way of thinking. You can do it intuitively or deductively, but Again, I would put the objectives down, I'd put the activities down um, against the objectives, and then I would look at which of these can I, what activities would be best done synchronously and which asynchronously. Now, I think it's not either or, it's a question of, as, you, as the questioner asked, the balance between that. And I don't think there's a, a right balance. Um, a, uh, you know, can 50%. you all hear me? Sorry? Um, fifty percent online or fifty percent fifty percent asynchronous, fifty percent synchronous. I, I don't think there is a balance there. When online learning started, it was all asynchronous. It was through a learning management system. It was text based and so on. And we we learned a lot of the benefits of asynchronous. There, um, students can reflect in discussions, for instance, before they post. Um, but also, there are skills that you need. To have synchronously, you need to be able to think on your feet, for instance, in an argument. So, again, look at the skills you're trying to develop and work out which ones would be best dealt with by using synchronous or asynchronous um, approaches. But tie it to your learning objectives and uh, the skills you're trying to develop. I seem to have lost Antonella. Uh, 
Ah, oh, there you are. There she is. Ah, here we are. What what happened? I don't know what happened, but we're back, and that's the. We were going asynchronous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We were just trying to explain <laughs> the right balance <laughs> between <laughs> synchronous and asynchronous. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's that's exactly what we were trying to explain. <laughs> so so great. Um, so uh, the um, last last uh, question uh, is related to um, the uh, this idea of trying to find a way. Uh, to uh, make uh, organization departments, uh, principals, ministers, you know, uh, all the ones in charge of uh, um, making decisions. Uh, in your experience, what do you think uh, is uh, uh, the best way to um, to to find uh, um, the right uh, the right direction and yeah. to you know put in place all the suggestions that you gave us today yeah this is a big question again okay. i could I have another webinar on that one <laughs> yeah um, we, we would like to <laughs> <laughs> okay it has to be at, at least three levels first of all there has to be leadership here the the senior the president or the vice chancellor and the head of teaching and learning in your institution, whoever that is, uh, has to take an initiative here um, and say, look, this is a situation that we mustn't allow to happen again. We need a strategy, we need a policy, set of policies and so on. But also it has to come from the bottom because the senior management don't really understand what that means if you're teaching physics or teaching history. So pressure has to come from the, the faculty as well, because in the end, most, uh, unless it's very different in Europe from Canada, the, the universities in Canada are run by the faculty, not by the administration in the end. The faculty do what they want to do. Um, and if they can't get what they want, they put pressure on the administration. So it, the pressure has to come from the bottom as well as from the top. And the critical people here are often what I call the middle management, the deans, uh, the deans and the heads of department, um, who need to uh, get their faculty together, say, look, we've had, what have we learned from this experience of having to go online? What do we need from the university to do it better next time? Um, so, that, so the deans can then take that to the senior management. So... What, what, what's needed is a dialogue, um, a continuing process of discussion between all three levels about what the strategy should be for the institution and not just about the strategy but realistic things like allocation of money. Uh, if we're going to hire more, fact, more support staff, where, where's the money going to come from, for instance? Um, what are we going to give up? Are we going to give up some of the lecturing, for instance, to allow more time for faculty and students to go online. You know, so there are quite critical policy decisions to be made. They will vary to some extent between department and department, but there has to be a process put in place for having these discussions. And that's the role of the senior management, to make sure those discussions are taking place and people are listening to each other. Yeah, in fact, in fact, again, a good balance uh, um, among all these different uh, actors uh, participating in in the action, uh, it it is it it can be uh, you know it would be very simple even if uh, sometimes it can be it can be difficult. But as you said, um, from what we 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 realize also from today's talk, um, we need resources, we need support, we need. A strong technological uh, support, so good technicians uh, supporting the action, and uh, so uh, the, the 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 will uh, from uh, the governments to put uh, resources on that. 
but also but also a strong uh, will from uh, bottom up from us from every uh, educator from every uh, one of us who could just through email as you mentioned before have anyway a good uh, um, distance learning uh, approach so i think that we are running out of time uh, i really uh, thank you all uh, for being with us i thank you tony for his kindness for ability he is uh, uh, really um, fantastic he, he, he accepted our invitation uh, immediately and he is with us supporting us and i really thank you really from the deep of my heart for your for your availability and for being with us today i thank you all uh, I, I think this has been a really uh, a real planetary event uh, there's a huge uh, demand there's an, um, an educational emergency more than the health emergency we are all facing and we need to be there uh, we demonstrated today that there's a large huge community uh, and that this community is getting stronger and stronger we will be with you supporting you from today for you know, several several weeks different uh, uh, topics uh, will be uh, developed with different experts as i said we will uh, go through uh, many many aspects of uh, uh, the um, of learning online uh, together uh, so mm, please uh, stay in touch you will get information you will find all the series and the topics published on our website and yes stay strong stay happy stay at home and we'll go over this terrible thing that's going on thank you so much to every one of you thank you Just a little Thank reminder. Thank you very much, Antonella. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tony. It was so nice seeing you. I hope to see you very soon. And thank you to the back room by Andrew, uh, Alistair for... Alistair, thank you for your support. And Dora. And Dora and the Secretariat and everyone. And there's open badges available. It's in the chat. Yeah, open badges available. And this is another issue we will talk about <laughs> in the next uh, uh, meetings uh, and all the best.